the day after the election. So there was one headline in the Wall Street Journal last week that put it this way, Wall Street is caught between Barack and a hard place. So having lost a battle for the White House and the Senate, conservatives, um, their hopes for a lot of regulation are out the window. Their hopes for more business-friendly changes to the tax code are out the window. Their hopes for repealing Obamacare are out the window. But looming beyond the political branches is the federal judiciary. And of course, when it comes to advancing business interests, the U.S. Supreme Court, depending on your political bent, is either benevolent or malevolent. And for those who accuse the Roberts Court of being reflexively pro-business, that bias is captured best um, really in three words, Citizens United and Walmart. Now, President Obama, of course, famously and publicly scolded the court over Citizens United in the State of the Union a couple years ago. And when Walmart was issued, the New York Times screamed um, this headline, Walmart wins, workers lose. The Financial Times headline read, Walmart discrimination win highlights claims of court bias. And the article added, the 5-4 vote, the 5-4 vote represented a familiar ideological split on the court which has played out in numerous cases since John Roberts took over as Chief Justice in 2005. And the Constitutional Accountability Center here in Washington insists there is a, quote, sharp ideological divide that did not exist before 2005. Now, defenders of the court will point out that over the Roberts Court's first five terms, only 10% of the court's business docket was decided by that classic familiar 5-4 split. And Professor Jeffrey Rosen argues there's even more nuance. More often than not, the Roberts Court is united rather than divided in cases affecting business interests. So he and others have noted that in recent years, almost 80%, 79% of the so-called business cases before the court have been decided by a lopsided margin of 7-2 or better. So there are dueling studies galore, believe me, no doubt we'll hear more about them. I'll keep the intros mercifully short. I just came off the campaign trail and got acquainted with this ignored beatitude, blessed are the brief, for they shall be reelected. Um, so our very unbashful panel today includes, uh, number one, Jeffrey Jacobson, litigation partner at the Bavoice and Plumpton. Mr. Jacobson has written and litigated extensively in the areas of complex litigation, e-discovery, class action defense. He holds bachelor's degrees and master's degrees from University of Pennsylvania and got his law degree from Columbia University. Next, Professor Alan Morrison, the Lerner Family Associate Dean for Public Interest and Public Service at the George Washington University Law School. For most of his career, Dean Morrison worked at Public Citizen where he co-founded with Ralph Nader back in 1972. And he directed it for about a quarter century. And my favorite part of his bio is this line. His time at Public Citizen strengthened his views that the courts are needed to protect corporations because they do not have enough money and power to obtain favorable results in elections and in the legislative and executive arenas. I like that. Um, he's argued about 20 cases before the US Supreme Court won um, some notable victories there. He's a graduate of Yale College, Harvard Law School, and was a commissioned officer in the U.S. Navy. Next, Martin Newhouse, president of the New England Legal Foundation. The foundation aims to protect free enterprise, defend economic rights, and in 2011 filed 17 appellate amicus briefs around the country, including the U.S. Supreme Court. Before joining the foundation in 2004, Dr. Newhouse was a 20-year lawyer at Ropes and Gray, um, he has more degrees than a thermometer, it seems, including <laughs> a bachelor's degree in economics from Columbia, a law degree from Yale, and then finally a PhD in modern European history from Columbia. Uh, fourth panelist, Mark Perry, litigation partner with Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, where he specializes in complex commercial litigation at both the trial and appellate levels, including, of course, the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, he has a special expertise in matters of complex civil procedure, and he regularly represents clients in class actions, an area that he also teaches at Georgetown University Law Center. He's a graduate of Cal Berkeley, 
University of Chicago Law School, after which he clerked for the shy and retiring Judge Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit, and then for Justice O'Connor. And my favorite line from his bio, he dreams of someday opening a little restaurant in the Blue Ridge Mountains. <laughs> and finally, John Vail, an original member of the Center for Constitutional Litigation, where he is VP and Senior Litigation Counsel. Mr. Vail focuses his litigation on the right to jury trial and the right of access to the courts before joining the Center for Constitutional Litigation. He worked with legal aid groups in various states for about 17 years and also did some human rights work in Eastern Europe. Uh, Mr. Vail attended the University of Chicago and the Vanderbilt Law School. So join me in thanking our esteemed panel. Thank you all. <laughs> and what we thought we would do, instead of having everybody give their sort of scripted five or 10 or 15 minute monologue, we thought we would um, just start off with a couple of questions to Martin Newhouse and Professor Morris and let them kind of set the table for our discussion, which we hope will be feisty and lively and, and spirited. Um, Mr. Newhouse, exactly a year ago, you wrote an article uh, for the Federal Society Legal Journal um, tackling head on this widely accepted notion that the court is metabolically hardwired to put a finger on the scale against consumers in favor of business. And you examined a, a very simple, some might say heretical question. Is it true? Is the court irredeemably pro-business or are things a bit more nuanced? And so tell the audience, what was your answer and why? Thank you. Um, at the risk of um, showing disrespect to the judiciary, I just want to say that uh, being part of an organization that represents sort of a, as a public advocate, a public interest advocate for business, I don't think it's fair to say that corporate America had one view or another about the 2012 election. Corporate America has many different views. And similarly, when it comes to the decisions by the Supreme Court, I think one has to be very careful before one jumps to conclusions about bias or meta metabolism of the court. So my article was looking at a question and that had to do with this, as the judge just put it, whether the court had some sort of, maybe bias is the wrong word, but let's use that word, some kind of sort of bias towards uh, the business side of business disputes. Now, one fact has to be taken into account, and that is that by all measures, unless I, as I understand it, the Roberts Court has taken generally more business cases than the Rehnquist Court did. As a result, you have more issues before the court that deal with business questions. So that sets the table for what happens. Now, I think one can say, I don't think anybody would disagree, I don't think anybody should disagree, that the court as a whole is certainly not reflexively pro-business. There are cases where the business parties lose. Nor, I would submit, uh, are the five Republican appointed justices who are usually tarred with the reputation of being irredeemably pro-business, reflexively pro-business. And we can go, if we have time, we can talk about cases in which uh, the court, of course, has ruled against businesses, cases in which the uh, Republican-appointed, more conservative justices have been on either side of the V, either side of the decision, uh, in cases that have gone against business, and they have been in the majority. Some of them have been in the majority of cases that have gone against business. And these are not cases, by the way, where one can say, well, the answer was obvious, because the answer was not obvious in these cases. <coughs> and when you come to look, though, at the five to four, the big five to four decisions, and, and uh, Judge Willett mentioned, of course, a couple of them, Citizens United, uh, is one of them. Another one is Dukes against Walmart. I think when you take a look at those cases, at least my, my analysis of them, they are it, calling them pro-business, pro-corporation, uh, doesn't really lead to any understanding of what was going on in the cases. I don't know how deeply I can go into them. I'll just take a couple of seconds. Uh, we have to remember that the Citizens United case, for example, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, was a case not brought not by a for-profit corporation, but brought by a non-profit corporation. That the statute or regulation that was struck down by the court was a control or a regulation of speech not simply by for-profit corporations, but speech by non-profits and labor unions. So the decision was a blow for the freedom of speech, for those who support it, for liberal advocacy groups, for labor unions, not just for corporations. Secondly, about Citizens United, it had nothing to do with foreign corporations, which is what President Obama accused the court of doing in his ill-timed and, in my view, 
uh, wrongful remarks in his State of the Union address. It had nothing at all to do with foreign corporations influencing elections. But more to the point about corporations versus non-corporations and, and the, what the public press does to these cases, in Citizens United, the, the, what the case seemed to raise for many people was why is it that corporations have First Amendment rights? As if that case decided the issue, but that case did not decide the issue. And in fact, if you read Justice Stevens' eloquent dissent in Citizens United, it's a very good dissent, he concedes, nobody's questioning that corporations have First Amendment rights. It was simply a question of where to draw the line. And I don't think the, the identity of the parties was really the issue in the case. Now getting to Dukes against Walmart, uh, I think there, as, as uh, Judge Willett pointed out, the New York Times editorial screamed, Walmart wins, workers lose. Now whether the workers lost or not, I don't know. Walmart certainly won as the party that prevailed in, in the case. But what is often lost in the commentary is that those who study the case know the class certification was actually reversed unanimously by the court because the parties had brought it under what the court deemed to have been the wrong section of Rule 23. Now it's true there was a five to four split and the so-called conservative judges were on the side that said certification should not be granted in addition because the commonality requirement had not been met. But I don't again think that that's an issue, in my view, reading the case, studying it, that's an issue of who the party was. It's an issue of how you come at the question of commonality and I think that everybody who looked at that case understood that the plaintiffs were mounting what by their lights was probably a really foresighted, foreseeing, very uh, interesting and innovative theory. But innovative theories by definition um, are theories that have a high risk of failure and I don't think many people were surprised by the result in Walmart. Again, whether the workers lost is an interesting question. I'd be happy to discuss that because I think the, there's a real question as to who was in that class. So to get back to the bottom line and to cut this short, the bottom line of my article was, yes, there have been victories for business parties in the Supreme Court. There have been victories for business parties in some very high profile cases. But I do not think that it's due to some metabolic or some bias on the part of either the court as a whole or the uh, conservative justices. And I can only say that we can watch the coming term uh, when we already have some very high profile business cases to see how the court decides those. Thanks very much. Um, Professor Morrison, Mr. Newhouse says that when it comes to painting the court as pro-business activists, uh, the facts are hostile witnesses. And um, I take it you disagree and that you believe there may indeed be an entrenched kind of pro-business leaning or bias on the court. So why don't you set the table for the opposing view? Thank you. Uh, I don't know whether one would properly term it as a bias or a leaning, but in terms of the results in the last half a dozen or so years, uh, there is no case that's been identified of great significance to the business community, which the business community has lost. Now, let me uh, make an addendum to that and point out that in one area, preemption of tort and similar claims uh, and excluding arbitration, which I put in a separate category, uh, the business community has lost some of those cases. Uh, there's an area in which I disagree with some who say that they always come out in favor of preemption. I would say the majority of them have come out in favor of, of preemption, uh, but not all of them. Uh, but other than that, in a wide range of areas from class actions to pleadings uh, to punitive damages to antitrust to Citizens United, uh, all of those cases came out on the side of, of, of business. Uh, and maybe uh, that's a coincidence, uh, but I don't think so. And, and actually, I think what I'd like to do is to spend a couple minutes talking about a case that most of you in the room have probably never paid any attention to. Uh, but as a famous general uh, said, and he probably wishes he hadn't said it, uh, leadership or bias uh, is what goes on when nobody else is looking. So I want to say that in connection with, the, with a case uh, uh, called Christopher uh, against uh, uh, the uh, uh, Smith Klein uh, Beecham. Uh, this is a case involving the Fair Labor Standards Act, and the question at issue uh, uh, was the meaning of a particular phrase in the statute uh, that applied to persons who are outside salesmen who do not work at the company offices. And the question was whether people who are whose job <coughs> it is to be detail men for drug companies. Uh, Smith Klein, having them as do every other drug company in the country, whether these detailers were salesmen within the meaning of the statute. Now, 
if you were a literalist and paid attention to the words, you would probably ask, well, did these people sell anything? And the answer to that question was no, for two reasons. The people they visited were doctors, and doctors didn't buy anything. And the second is, the detailers had no authority and never made a single sale to anyone. The only sales made by the drug companies are those that are sent out from the headquarters or wherever they're sent to, and they are sold to pharmacists, hospitals, and so forth. None of them are sold to the doctors who are the people who the detail men, and these are mostly men, visit. All right. So the question was, what do you do with the fact that these people were not sales people? Well, there are two things you could do. You could read the statute literally, <laughs> which is what the conservative justices claim that they are doing most of the time, and say they didn't sell anything, and if anybody sold anything, it was somebody else, and nobody sold anything to the doctors, and therefore the statute doesn't apply. Or you could say, well, they're out operating outside the office, the purpose of the statute is the same, and therefore, we ought to be sensible and think about the goals of the statute and why Congress would have written it this way. And we ought to treat these people, even though they're not literally salespeople, as salespeople. And if you reach that conclusion, the statute would, would, have, would apply to them. Well, the majority in that case reached the latter conclusion. Uh, the majority opinion written by Justice Samuel Alito was joined by the four other conservatives on the court. And how did they get to this result? Well, it turns out that the result was a result that favored the defendant corporation. And people, members of the court, who usually insist upon reading things literally, never talk about purposes, goals, or effect, decided the case in favor of the defendant because the result was to exclude the workers, the detail men, from the overtime protection of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now, one could argue, perhaps persuasively, that the Fair Labor Standards exclusion should not have applied for the reasons I just gave. It doesn't fit the purposes, doesn't have the goals, they act very much like salespeople. The problem was that they weren't selling anything. And so we have a situation in which my only explanation for this is that the majority decided we wanted to come out in favor of the businessmen against the workers, and that's exactly what they did, and literalism be damned. Thank you. <laughs> it seems the battle is joint. Um, <laughs> Um, I will say, you know, Martin Newhouse said in his article for Engage, the Federal Society Journal, that, quote, it is clear beyond dispute that none of the justices is reflexively pro-business. Um, he points out that each of them has voted against and written against corporate interests. Um, again, Mr. Newhouse says this is clear beyond dispute, and I wonder, does anybody take issue with that, that categorical statement. I, I, I would never dispute the fact that in some cases they have voted against corp corporations. And if by reflexive you mean in every single case they always <coughs> vote in favor of a company, that's the answer is not correct. I mean, take, take the Chamber of Commerce case against Arizona a couple of years ago. Uh, that was a business case. It was not, in my judgment, an important business case. Uh, and the majority, the conservatives, voted on the side of states' rights and they upheld Arizona's position with regard to certain rules about immigration. Uh, I, I thought it was a hard case. I thought the, 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 the chamber had a better side of it. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but they lost. Uh, so I would never say that, 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 that nobody ever votes in favor of, of, of corporations or always votes in favor of co corporations. My position is that in the vast majority of cases, and in particular the ones that really count, that operate across the board, uh, unlike the Chamber of Commerce case, which was a small matter uh, that didn't really affect the heart of corporate America, uh, that they ruled in favor of the companies in those big ticket cases. Judge, if uh, sure, let no, me, let me jump time. in with a couple of things, because I'll, I'll I'll point to a couple of specific things. You know, uh, first of all, ne neither I know Justices Alito and Scalia are going to be around. They're not. No, they're not in the room, are they? That's good. I, I just didn't want you to mix me up. I'm the Italian guy from Jersey who's not on the court. So that's uh, the, uh, but it's, it's true. You had, you had pieces of Citizen, Citizens United and Walmart that had unanimous decisions. But on the two pieces where they were split 5-4, they split over questions that were not raised by the parties. The court 
pulled both of those questions and posed those questions itself. Those questions were not posed in the petitions for certiorari. So any good newspaper editor will tell you when you want to look for bias, you don't look at the words of an article. You look at what you choose to cover. So I would take those as evidence of, of a certain bias toward at least addressing questions of import to corporate America, a term where we seem to be using okay. And I'd point to one very specific instance where, and this, uh, this could get us into the arbitration cases, but it's from Concepcion. And I think uh, it's, there's a quotation just in Justice Scalia's opinion. Let me get it right here. He, uh, qu he cites Moses Cohn, which is an old case and a seminal case in, in, the arbit in arbitration law. And he said, for a liberal federal policy favoring arbitration. Now, I think most people in the room would take it in as a given that there's a liberal federal policy favoring arbitration. In fact, after Concepcion is really the first clear statement from the court that that's what it's limited to. But Justice Scalia left one word off the quotation from Moses Cohn. Moses Cohn was about a liberal federal policy favoring arbitration agreements. And that goes back to the purposes of the Federal Arbitration Act, which was never about favoring arbitration. It was about assuring that one remedy, the remedy of specific performance, was available in contract disputes about the enforceability of arbitration agreements. Before the Arbitration Act, arbitration agreements, you could go to court. The court would say, yeah, we'll enforce your arbitration agreements. We'll give you all the damages you can prove for its breach, but we're not going to specifically enforce the agreement. That was the original purpose of the act. It has morphed into something very, very different, which I won't go on about that now. I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> well, let me try to lasso Mark Perry and and Jeff Jacobson into the discussion, our two resident class action defense experts. Of course, we've been talking a little bit about Walmart v. Dukes, and which for so many people is exhibit A when people accuse the court of being sort of uh, knee-jerk or at least having a, a leaning um, in favor of, of business. Um, so you can feel free to talk about that. Or if you want to engage on Concepcion, which of course was the 5-4 decision on this really hard-fought question about the constitutionality of of um, class arbitration waivers. So feel free to engage on either or both of those or anything else that's on your mind. Well, anything that's on our mind is a big question, but <laughs> <coughs> you know, the, let me start with the Walmart case. The, the class in Walmart could not have been certified in any court in the United States other than a district court in California and it could not have been affirmed in any circuit other than the Ninth Circuit. Six five. Let's be clear. And one thing that the, uh, that the court did in Walmart was simply bring the Ninth Circuit back into line with where all the other courts had always been. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, the judge said there's nothing particularly surprising about the result in Walmart. That's exactly right. I mean, it was a question of how you get there, but that class could never, should never have been brought, should never have been I think certified. even Linda Greenhouse said it was the least surprising decision of the term. Well, and that, that leads to a, a bit of a broader point, though, is, you know, th there's a selection bias in these discussions, if we're going to talk about bias, because we have a limited sample set of cases to analyze. You know, there are more business cases now than, than there used to be, but there's still, you know, 20, 30 a term, depending on how you count them, that really matter to the business community. Uh, a huge chunk of those are, of course, business versus business cases, which in, by definition, the loser is a business and the winner is a business, and nobody up here is defending the losing businesses, I guess. Uh, but that's a big part of them. Another big chunk of the docket is business versus government cases, and while the businesses win some of those, the government wins more of them. That's just the nature of government. Those don't get rolled into here. So really, when we talk in this question of is the court... Um, have an institutional bias. We're talking about a very small subset, or at least I think Alan and John are talking about a very small subset of individual versus business case, or consumer versus business case, or employer versus business case, which is you know less than a handful every year. 
And on those, uh, the court is split just about 50-50. Uh, the, 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 the plaintiffs win some, the Halliburton case, the Matrix case, there'll be a couple more this term, there, but that, they sort of go by the by. They're, they're losses for the business community and they become part of the Many law. Many of them nine to nothing. Many of them nine to nothing. They were cases that where the, where the business pushed or the courts went too far and the court corrects it. That happens on both sides of the V. We just hear more about it when the business happens to win. But on those, I'd like to make two points. One is uh, there is a significant issue in that the business decisions, that is the, the ones we're talking about, Concepcion, Walmart, and so forth, the businesses win because they are right. I mean, they, are, they have secured the majority of the United States Supreme Court, oh, the okay. ultimate decision maker, and they're not all 5-4. In fact, many of them are not 5-4. They, they may be divided, but they're not divided along those same lines. The other is the business community has become more organized in looking at its cases. Businesses are institutional litigants, um, and an institutional litigant will select those cases best um, calculated, calibrated to win, and there may be issues that come up repeatedly in cases, and you wait for the right one. The, the federal government is the master of this, of course, the Solicitor General keeping a very close watch on things and getting the right case to the Supreme Court, which, which uh, explains some of the victories. Uh, organizations like John's do exactly the same thing. You stop litigating some cases if you've got the wrong judge, the wrong decision, and businesses are getting better at that too and evaluating their own portfolios and not pushing every case to the limit so that those cases that do get to the Supreme Court, you know, if you want to examine what class can be certified, the Walmart case was a poster child for what class could not be certified and, and it was 9-0 as to a significant, uh, by the way, significantly pro-employee, pro-plaintiff part of the decision in my opinion. Uh, so that there, is, there are dynamics here that are entirely unrelated to uh, bias or leanings or dark conspiracies, but rather related to the merits of the litigation. Uh, and the third, final, uh, third point, and I'll, I'll shut up, is a lot of these cases, these business on, uh, versus consumer cases, they come up out of direct conflicts from the courts of appeals, where the Ninth Circuit is an outlier or something else. And these are national statutes and national litigation, the securities cases, the employment cases, the RICO cases, the arbitration cases. It doesn't make sense to have um, disuniformity. And so when the court has to take it, you know, some of these cases, there just has to be a rule. It doesn't matter what the rule is, but there has to be a rule. And, and once they've got them, then they decide. I want to pull on a thread that Martin started us with about there being more business cases on the Roberts Court docket than we saw in the Rehnquist Court. And let's think about that for a minute. 1973, the Supreme Court decides Eisen. And that was on a narrow issue of notice, but they had that line in there about nothing in Rule 23 gives a court the right to conduct a preliminary inquiry on the merits. Nine years later, in 1982, they decide general telephone against Falcon. And the Supreme Court says there must be a rigorous analysis. And then from 1982, for the following quarter century, the Supreme Court went radio silent on what Rule 23 was all about. And in their absence, it was the Wild West. And you know, the ninth, you can make a pun about the Ninth Circuit, but I mean, the class action jurisprudence, particularly in the district courts in the years prior to the adoption of Rule 23F in 1998, the jurisprudence, because it all happened in the district court, district courts completely misread eyes and were certifying things left and right. You couldn't get them to the circuit courts. I mean, there were a couple of laughable ways that circuit courts were finding a way somehow, including mandamusing a dead judge in the American medical systems case. You just couldn't get any kind of guidance. And in the, in the absence of that, class action law became a shakedown racket. Now, not, and I don't, I'm speaking too generally. I mean, there are, there are, there are righteous class action cases, but, but in the main, and I'm sure that I'll have disagreement about this, but in the main, class actions are not legitimate tools. I mean, they're, they're being used by plaintiff's lawyers as extortion tools. Uh, when companies do, do bad things, they, they settle pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, these class actions are filed in the main by people that are using it with a very powerful, a plaintiff's lawyer, not a consumer, is using it as a very powerful tool. Now, 2001, Rehnquist Court, class certification in the Second Circuit, in the Visa MasterCard case. This is, an, this is a, an antitrust class action in which, by the way, Walmart was a member of the class, ironically enough. Um, the class was worse, I would argue, than the class that was certified in Walmart against Dukes. It was every retailer from bodegas in Harlem to Walmart. 
were part of this class against Visa and MasterCard over their rules. Second Circuit upholds it, both uh, um, two to one and then en banc, goes to the Supreme Court and they didn't take it. But in Walmart v. Dukes, they did. The, the circuit court law was already developing to suggest, and the Second Circuit was an outlier when it decided this case. The circuit court law outside of the Second and the Ninth was already going where the Supreme Court ended up in Dukes to the point where when the Supreme Court decided Dukes, every circuit in the country other than the Ninth, which was 6-5 split on Dukes, every circuit court in the country <coughs> had decided basically what Justice Scalia wrote for the 5-4 court. There was very little new ground broken in Walmart against Dukes that, the, that most of the circuit courts hadn't already decided. So I would, I would accept the premise that what we are having under the Roberts Court finally is they're coming back onto the field after a quarter century absence, letting class action law develop below them. And you know it's even possible that there is a little bit of pent up, can I finally speak now, says Justice Scalia, about this racket. And this panel, you know, I was saying to, to Professor Morrison, maybe slightly premature because, you know, who, I don't know what they're going to do with the cases that they have now. I read the oral argument transcript in Amgen, and uh, that's the case where the Supreme Court is, is considering whether securities class action plaintiffs need to prove materiality at the class certification stage um, in order to, to obtain class certification. Justice Kagan had made what I thought was a pretty good point that, wait a minute, if uh, there's no materiality, that's not just no class certification, that's no case. So what's the, why is there a reason to do that before class certification? And Justice Scalia said, well, because of the inexorable pressure that's put on defendants to settle once a class is certified, so let's have, let's decide as much of this up front as possible. If that happens to command a majority of the court to decide all kinds of issues that would turn the case off early, I might change my view as to whether the, whether the court can, can be uh, correctly described as pro-business. Um, similarly, the Supreme Court just this week took the Amex case from the Second Circuit, which is the, you know, well, I think we ought to, we ought to just as well get into the arbitration cases, and I'll shut up after about 30 more seconds, but, you know, I think that there are, there are arguments to be made on both sides for whether the Supreme Court did the right thing in the Concepcion case. I mean, you, you read the majority opinion and the dissent, and you see good points in both. If the Supreme Court dis takes Amex and reverses it and holds that you can, you can require a consumer to arbitrate an anti a, a complex antitrust uh, claim on an individual basis, not a class basis, if they rule that an arbitration clause can be read that broadly, then okay, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a pro-business decision that will more or less allow any corporation that does business directly with a consumer and can have a contract signed with them more or less exempt them from all but governmental prosecution of cases that will basically end uh, for them consumer class actions as we know it. I'm a little bit of a contrarian. I don't know what they're going to do with, uh, with that case, but I guess we'll find out and then maybe we can do this again next year. Can I say a word sure, about go ahead. Uh, I should disclose that uh, I helped the plaintiff's lawyers uh, in the case in the Court of Appeals and in the Supreme Court. Uh, and there are two aspects to the Walmart uh, decision, one of which was unanimous. Uh, that was the part that said you couldn't certify the case under B2, you had to go under B3. And part of the problem there was that the uh, class had not allowed, or for that matter, ever been asked to allow individual class members to opt out or to be provided individual notice with an opportunity to opt out. Um, I have long taken the view that in cases involving substantial amounts of money, as there were certainly at issue in Walmart, regardless of the label and under the what provision the case is being brought, that individuals should have the right to opt out and there should be no mandatory damages classes. Uh, that is a position which is pro-class member. Uh, it's not necessarily pro-business. And so that part of the opinion was, I think, un unanimous because it was right. <coughs> Uh, and that's a position I've taken in opposition to class action settlements over the years uh, and has never commanded a majority till now. Uh, second, on, on the ma majority five to four on commonality, uh, I do not think that Justice Scalia's result is necessarily wrong. 
uh, in the Walmart case. It was a very hard case. Uh, they were arguing, in essence, that although there was a formal uh, policy of treating women equally, uh, there was also a policy of allowing discrimination, uh, of, I'm sorry, of allowing promotion and pay decisions to be made at the local level. And the problem was, if you have decisions made at the local level, how can you possibly have a nationwide class? Uh, Justice Scalia made that point in oral argument. His opinion went much beyond that, and he established, uh, arguably at least, requirements for commonality that will be extremely difficult to prove, uh, not just in a case like Walmart, uh, but in many other cases as well. Uh, I think the Ninth Circuit thought it was following what the other circuits did at least in, in, a, in approach, uh, although arguably not in this case. And so uh, I guess I'm less concerned with the fact that the uh, Walmart won uh, the first part of the case, the commonality, than how they won it and what that says about future decisions. But haven't several yeah, single state classes been certified now? I believe they have. They have they're certainly seeking it. Well, they've gotten Martin, it in a few. Yeah. Martin, go ahead. Yeah, I want to just uh, <coughs> make a few comments based on, on what people have said. Uh, the comment was made that some of these business cases may be most of the good decisions for business were right, and I think I think that gets at something that when people talk about pro or anti-business bias, there's a there's a sense in which, uh, and I think the media is guilty of this, of not looking at the merits of the cases, but simply saying, well, if the business party won, it must have been pro-business. Uh, they did it because they like business, because they're in favor of business, not because of what the issue was. Now. Um, there are cases where, in fact, the issue is one of statutory interpretation. Uh, and there, maybe you have habits of thought, ways of looking at things that are different, uh, depending on the justice, the, who, who has been, a, what the justice's uh, life experience has been, what their judicial philosophy is. But it's not a business bias. No more, no more than the four uh, justices who dissented in, um, in Citizens United would consider themselves to be anti-business. Now, now, another comment on Citizens United. I think it is really mistaken uh, for everyone, anyone, to look at that case as, as something to do with some nefarious, deep pro-business issue. As I mentioned before, it was a case brought by a nonprofit. It, it governs not just corporations that make money, but corporations that are nonprofits and also labor unions. I think what's at issue in that case are fundamentally different views of the First Amendment. I mean, that's why the case looked at the, the, the justices, the majority looked at the issue and brought that issue up. It has nothing to do with, uh, in my view, it has nothing to do with favoring corporations. In fact, I'm not sure that the Citizens United case itself has had an impact on what corporations have done. I'd like to see a study done about that. There are follow-up cases that have definitely had an impact. But it had to do with the issue of the First Amendment and what you think the First Amendment is like. And let me just refer to two other cases that I think indicate, again, these different ways of looking at things that are not pro or anti-business. These are two cases. Again, you could say, in one case, in both cases, the business is one, so if you want to chalk it up to a pro-business case. And these are two cases that we had discussed briefly uh, in, over email before, the, uh, before this panel, and they're jurisdiction cases. There's the Goodyear case, and there's the um, McIntyre case, both personal jurisdiction cases. In the Goodyear case, I believe uh, Justice Ginsburg wrote the, wrote the opinion for a unanimous court. It was a case dealing with general jurisdiction, and found that there could not be jurisdiction issue, uh, exercised over foreign subsidiaries of Goodyear. So in that case, business won. Uh, Goodyear itself had not contested jurisdiction, as I understand it. The McIntyre case was a case dealing with an English manufacturer of a machine that allegedly caused horrible injury to the plaintiff in New Jersey. The English manufacturer had not sold that machine in New Jersey. It had been sold through an agent that the English manufacturer had retained to sell its goods throughout the country. It was a specific jurisdiction case, i.e., was the fact of the injury in New Jersey sufficient to bring into the state the manufacturer of being sued on the injury that that, that, um, that machine caused? In that case, uh, it was a, I think, a five to, four, five to three, maybe, a five to four decision. Uh, four, five to four, four uh, conservative justices. Uh, four, uh, two, three. So four, two, two, three. Four, four, two, four, three. Four, two, three. Okay. So you had, you had, you had four, decision, four, de, four of the conservative justices uh, basically set, setting a rule saying there could never be jurisdiction. Then you had Breyer's decision saying under the, under the current precedence there was no jurisdiction. And then you had Ginsburg writing a very stern dissent in that case 
basically saying, in, this, in what I consider to be an astonishing way, anybody who's read International Shoe would have to find jurisdiction in this case. But I want to read a quote, very brief quote, one sentence, from Justice Kennedy's opinion in the McIntyre case, in which, again, the corporation won, just as in the um, Goodyear case. Corporation won, no personal jurisdiction. And he writes, free-form notions of fundamental fairness dismissed from traditional practice cannot transform a judgment rendered in the absence of authority into law. And you have between Justice Ginsburg's dissent and Justice Kennedy's four, per, four justice uh, decision, uh, opinion, a different way of thinking about the issue. It's not pro-business. It's not a quite, I don't think the parties really mattered. I mean, they mattered because it only could be a business party in this case, but a different way of thinking about the issue. I think that's what we should focus on, not this shimmer that the media love and that certain people like about pro-business or anti-business, but what are the issues involved and what are the motivations and the ways of in analyzing those issues that move the court towards the decisions that it reaches. Well, let's take well, a let step. Me let go me ahead. focus go on ahead. a couple of those. Am I on here? Yeah, there you go. Uh, I, I was counsel in Jay McIntyre, so I have some special knowledge of that case. Uh, and it and is- I a, have to teach it. <laughs> it's even more painful. I envy him less. Uh, but it is a little bit outside the business context, but let me talk about the, a specific thing that Marty addresses. I think it's a, it's a very odd case, and it, uh, it, it illustrates something with the, when the court's selecting cases. I think I, I, I've got a law review article on this. You can look it up. I mean, I think the court took the case because of a, I think it was actually a pretty pedestrian case it was a very provocative opinion from the New Jersey Supreme Court. Uh, and I'm actually with Justice Ginsburg. I think it was resolved easily. Uh, Justice Breyer and Justice Alito, in their concurring opinion, said it was resolved easily on traditional things, too. They just resolved it differently than the way I would have resolved it. But the plur plurality in the pin opinion that Marty uh, cites, I think, is something that I, you're the Federalist Society. The opinion does not say that due process, the Commerce Clause, the Foreign Commerce Clause, any other piece of the Constitution limited the power of New Jersey to exercise personal jurisdiction over this English manufacturer. What it said is that New Jersey did not have that power. So the question I pose to you as the Federalist Society is where does the Supreme Court get the power to say that a state which has police powers does not have a power that the state says it has? That's a different question from saying that a piece of the con federal constitution limits the power of the state. The opinion is that the state does not have the power. So I leave that with you about, and I think Jay McIntyre becomes, you know, the, I, I think it's, it involves a bigger ideological question, but like with the class action cases, you know, it, it's not plaintiffs, you, you could call this a business bias or a defense bias might be better. It, it, it's not plaintiffs who are seeking not to have jurisdiction exercised over them in a particular place. And just like that, uh, Marty writes in his piece about uh, <clears throat> you can't tell from Concepcion that it's a, a, a particularly pro-business or pro-consumer this decision, but it's the reality is that outside of the antitrust context, you know, businesses are not plaintiffs in class action cases. Businesses are defendants in class action cases. So just by, by that fact, when you decide against the existence of class actions, you come to a pro-business point. John, John well, in, the Stolt in the Stolt Nielsen case, businesses were in fact the plaintiffs. And that's the case that established that you have to have, you have to agree in the arbitration agreement itself that you will allow class arbitration. Let me inject myself like Candy Crowley here and 
and <laughs> step us, let's step us away from individual cases for a second and just take a wider empirical look. Somebody once said there are in ascending order of deception, there are liars and damn liars and statistics. And with that disclaimer in mind, I want to tee up this recent critique, um, which I, I presume a number of our panelists are familiar with, probably a lot of you too. There was a, a 2010 study by some law professors and also Judge Posner was part of that group. And they did it for the New York Times. They analyzed just under 1,500 cases stretching back to 1953, I believe it was. Um, and they concluded that the Roberts Court, number one, agreed to hear more business cases, and number two, found in favor of business more often in roughly 61% of the cases compared with 46% uh, in the last five years of the Rehnquist Court, 42% of all courts since 1953. Another study has pointed out that you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce had a very you know, successful year at the court in the last term, had a perfect or near perfect term in terms of the cases they um, got involved with and filed amicus briefs in. Um, and, the, and this one group says the chamber success rate is significantly higher than it was under the Roberts, than it, uh, under the Roberts court than it was under either Chief Rehnquist or Berger. And I'll just make that a, a jump ball for anybody who wants to tackle it. Can I just respond on the Posner, the study in, involving Judge Posner? Um, as I read the study, so someone correct me if I'm wrong, all they looked at were the identity of the parties. They did not look at the merits of the issues. They did not look at what was at stake. They didn't look at whether it was a regulatory case or any kind of case. So I think the Posner, the Posner study uh, is really uh, a very little help to anybody because unless you know what the case is about, it's really hard to know uh, what it actually shows that a business party may have prevailed. In, in fact, as was pointed out, many of these cases were business against business cases. So I, I, I was very disappointed, in fact, by the study. I didn't think it was very illuminating. Go ahead. Uh, two things. One is, I don't know how you look at the merits of the cases and decide who's right or wrong. That's the question before the court. The question is, do we have a systematic bias one way or the other? And by saying, if you look at the case and I think the business is right, therefore there's no bias, doesn't seem to me to answer the question. So that's point one. Point two, uh, as far as the study is concerned, I didn't look at it because uh, the question is not numerically who won the most cases. Uh, that's of modest significance. My view is that if you look at the important cases, the ones that really matter, that have ramifications beyond the particulars, that by and large, the businesses have won those. They've won all the arbitration cases because it's business that wants things to go into arbitration. They won the two personal jurisdiction cases. Goodyear was correctly decided. Goodyear was a farce in the lower court. They never should have ruled in favor of, of the plaintiff in that, in that case. Uh, McIntyre is a completely different matter. A big, big question now as to who's gonna be able to be sued where. The one thing that's clear about this is there's gonna be massive discovery because if you read Alito's opinion and, and, and Breyer's opinion, I guess Breyer wrote the opinion, they say there weren't enough facts. Well, how are you gonna get facts unless you start taking discovery? Uh, and so there's gonna be huge amounts of discovery on, on these jurisdictional issues. The pleading case, Bell Atlantic and Iqbal, surely against them. Class action, surely in the wrong direction. Uh, Lots of these cases, all of the big ones, have been won by the, uh, by the side of business. And so you don't have to decide that they've won every case or be swayed <coughs> by the numbers, but just try to identify one really significant case that businesses has lost in the, in the last half a dozen years. Oh, and I think, I said in the preemption area, outside the preemption area, it's, it, it, and, and they won, they've won two others uh, uh, bizarrely. I mean, if, if you had to explain to a non-lawyer how in the generic drugs there's preemption, in the uh, uh, pioneer drugs there's no preemption, and in the medical devices there is preemption, when all of the, the, the cases are governed by the FDA and the same procedures are followed and many of them say, you couldn't explain it. They purported to do it by what the statute says, but I agree with you that that was the Wyatt's case was a big one, but all it does was remove the threshold barrier. 
But, but you should, you see, you, you, when you say, uh, you, but look, I mean, when I say looking at the merits, I don't mean to make the decision, but look at what kind of case it is. Okay? Oh, okay. Well, but that's I, not what you said. I didn't I, understand I apologize. That. I meant okay. look what kind of case it is before you decide. I agree but, that but, business but, against but, business, patent cases, you can't, in, in a patent case, when you have two businesses, the eBay case, when you had two businesses on either side, to say that business one would be a ridiculous thing to say. Uh, but but well, I also <coughs> think if you take the Wyeth case and then the generic drug case, there are differences. The, the, the difference between the cases, whether you agree with the decisions or not, was based on the fact that the, 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 the name manufacturer of the drug can change the labeling, and the generic manufacturer has no ability to change the labeling. Okay. So there are differences. Yes. Uh, and I think, so that I, I think you have to take that into account. You might disagree with the, with the result. M may I Mark, pick up on the, uh, the, the, the type of case issue? Because much of the hand-wringing and teeth gnashing really has nothing to do with businesses. It has to do with access to the federal courts. That's really what's going on in the arbitration cases. That's what's going on in part in the class action cases. That is what's going on in the preemption cases. That's what's going on in the uh, broadly defined cause of action cases. That is, is there a cause of action under the securities laws or the environmental laws or whatever? Um, that is a philosophical divide as well. It is one that is more plaintiff versus defendant than consumer versus business, although the businesses may be the defendants that have the money. I get that. Um, and on that one, there is, I would agree, a divide in the court, but it is a jurisprudential divide. It is a philosophical divide. It says those are the things, personal jurisdiction aside, all these other things are subject to the plenary control of Congress. Congress may define who goes to court, who arbitrates, who has a cause of action, whose claims are preempted, and the court is divided and has historically been divided on the breadth, the flexibility, or the uh, constraints they will put on that question. In many of the cases that you all are, are complaining about are in fact not the business one because it's a business, but the plaintiff lost because the law didn't give him the right to go to court and the majority called him on it and the dissent would have said, but we can make the law flexible enough to allow this claim to proceed. And the majority said, no, that is the Congress's job. And therefore, that is explaining many of the 5-4 decisions have nothing to do, as I said, with this so-called business bias, but as a jurisprudential reflection of the way to read jurisdiction conferring statutes or arbitration permitting statutes or the other kinds of structural limitations that Congress puts on litigants in our federal system. Just honest disagreements over legal doctrine. Absolutely. Uh, one, one thing that's made me scratch my head as I've thought about the panel is, you know, to what degree can the success of business interest in the court be attributed possibly, at least in part, just to the emergence of specialized appellate experts, practice groups at the major firms. And they're usually led by, by longtime veterans of the SG's office at the Department of Justice and you know, appellate stars who now make their living representing business interests. And I think from 96 to the present, every single former SG um, has gone on to private practice representing business, with the obvious exception being Justice Kagan, but they've all otherwise gone on to you know, private um, large law firm practice representing, by and large, corporate interests before the court. I just wonder to what degree does, does the sort of advent or emergence of specialized appellate practice have? Well, I think Mark already responded to that, and I agree with him uh, on that point. There's a good bit of academic research Earlier on, uh, I think Mark Galanter from Wisconsin being the first, there's some, some more recent stuff on it about uh, how, and I, I do think this points to a business piece because businesses are more repeat players in the court and have a better selection uh, opportunity to coordinate and select. First, they have a bigger volume of cases and they have a better uh, capacity to select which ones uh, might be taken on for appellate opinion. So I, th I, think, I think that does have something to do with it. I wanna point to one, uh, one specific way that I think, uh, S Citizens United, I agree, is a very, very difficult, complex case for many reasons. Uh, it's a case, I've been the president of the ACLU in two different states, and. The ACLU was on the Citizens United side of Citizens United. Uh, 
and I think the ACLU splits about 51-49 on which side to be on. But uh, there is a, there, the thing that I think businesses want in Citizens United that's more is a view of what the corporation is. And this is a jurisprudential question. I mean, Citizens United uh, appears to resolve uh, in a different way from the, the, the long history of how a corporation had or received and what, what constitutional rights it might be afforded. The root jurisprudential decision in Citizens United that a corporation is merely an association of persons and is therefore entitled to the rights that the persons have is something that I think will, is a big idea that's planted that could have large pro-business jurisprudential effects coming down the line, particularly, I think, uh, with regard to how you gauge commercial speech, which has been a, a big issue playing around in the courts for oh, uh, 20 years or so. Mr. Twill, could I, could I just respond? I, I, that's an interesting point. We could debate that point, too. But uh, if I could respond to your question about specialized appellate lawyers. Um, uh, I don't know. Does, does anybody else answer that? Or, I mean, I, Mark, Mark had mentioned it yeah, earlier. Yeah, okay. So I want to just, I wanna just <coughs> add, add to what Mark said. We, we did a panel in my organization in 2006 uh, on the Roberts Court, actually, and whether it was uh, favorable to business. Whether it was, and and uh, we had uh, two solicitor generals on the panel who are now in private practice. Um, and they were before the court, I think, five days a week. Um, no. I, okay, four days a week? Well, they only sit three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, a fact. Okay. Well, that's the impression they and gave. And only two weeks a month. <laughs> that's the impression And only seven gave. months a year. That's the impression they gave. Uh, uh, in any event. No, no. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. Your partner, Ted Olson, wouldn't do that. What do you, Mark? O only, only on uh, alternate Tuesdays. <laughs> um, but but no, I, I don't think we should slight the, the skill of the advocates uh, who have come before us in representing business, but I do think you do have a, a, a very specialized group of national firms with offices in Washington, and I don't, I'm not sure what that means, except that the court, the court knows these people, uh, and um, I think has respect for them, and so listens to what they say. My, my experience as a, as a litigator has been when the court knows you and respects you, you still may lose, so. And Jeff, had, Jeff had given us a, a quick peek over the horizon, looking at cases sort of on their way to the court, kind of on the conveyor belt, I just wonder from anyone who wants to chime in, what are the potentially sort of blockbuster cases, any, any, any beyond Jeff mentioned, that are on tap either in the current term or percolating that might add to this debate over whether the court is uh, reflexive or, or corporatist in its outlook? I know there's the IMS health case, which is a huge commercial speech case about data mining for marketing purposes, probably the most important advertising um, case to come before the court in maybe a decade or more. But what others out there are sort of relevant to our discussion today? Just, just very quickly on the specialized appellate practice point, I mean, I would, I would argue that the advocacy in the class action cases didn't reflect a lot of on the ground knowledge of the way class actions play out. It was, it was something where, where you could see that it was a bunch of very, very smart lawyers that were used to engaging at the Supreme Court but didn't actually know the subject as well as they do in other kinds of cases. And I think. Part of that was reflected, somebody mentioned earlier that the, uh, the, the justices took on questions that the parties didn't raise, and, and I would argue, well, why didn't they? Because I think that they were really sort of the core issues in the case. Um, so I, I, I don't know whether the, whether the specialized practice really comes into play, as this is maybe my view. As far as the important cases, I, I, I'm dying to segue back into the arbitration cases, because I think that Amex is really the Blockbuster. If you're going to if you're going to have a discussion about a, the court being pro-business or not pro-business, you almost start and end with with American Express because, I mean, look, I, I agree to a point with the idea that the question that was decided in Concepcion was doctrinal and that you know it was it was basically people having a different view of of what a law means and both both sides coming intellectually, honestly, to the debate. Um, but, look, I mean, right now, the state of the law is under Concepcion that 
Hewlett Packard, which sells computers uh, in stores, is subject to all manner of consumer class actions, but Dell that sells directly uh, and can jam an arbitration clause isn't. And if you sell your products, and, 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 and there are industries, the cell phone industry, the banking industry, that basically everything is done directly with consumers, and they can more or less exempt themselves from all kinds of laws by virtue of arbitration clauses. American Express, in the Second Circuit ruling, carved out a loophole to that that basically said if the clause would, would, would become uh, exculpatory, if, if you really, if, if, if what this would mean is that you can't effectively vindicate a federal right, then the arbitration clause becomes unconscionable, you can't enforce it. And the Supreme Court is, has that issue before it. And if they reverse the Second Circuit, Second Circuit, by the way, has decided this three times, including post Concepcion. They keep, the, the American Express keeps asking the Second Circuit, you know, would, would you look at what the Supreme Court said and, you know, would you, would you get with the program? And the Second Circuit keeps saying no. And by the way, it's interesting, Justice Sotomayor, because she was on the Second Circuit at the time, is recused, and so one of the four mm -hmm. can't play. <coughs> um, if the five justices that decided Concepcion say the Second Circuit is wrong, and the arbitration clause controls, and you can have a class waiver in all of these contexts. I, 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 you know, I'm going to be the first one to say, "Boy, that's a pro-business decision." I mean, that that can't be spun any other way than that is a pro-business decision that is that is taking the FAA to to a, a pole of possible interpretations. Well, uh, the court has already said that. The fact that it's federal law doesn't matter in arbitration. It's already said it doesn't matter that it's an antitrust case in arbitration. Uh, the only question is, was there an agreement? And uh, I would love to see Jeff be right uh, that the Second Circuit's upheld, but it's going to be pretty hard for me to see how they're going to reach that distinction. So, uh, and you know, in terms of where they have come in, ter in terms of a statute that was written in 1925, which was supposed to be applicable to business-to-business -business arbitrations, to make it uh, applicable to a case like Concepcion, in which the only issue in the case was whether a $30 tax that the state of California imposed was, uh, was undermined by the fact that the uh, company advertised the phones for free when they knew there was going to be a $30 charge, uh, either that's a misrepresentation or it's not a misrepresentation. And nobody could bring these cases on their own. It either was going to be a class action in which everybody was going to win or everybody was going to lose or there'd be a settlement of some kind. It was the perfect case for the class action. Even this court could not have found lack of commonality uh, since everybody signed the same uh, contract. And yet the court said, no, you can go off and do it by yourself. And yes, if AT&T pays everybody their $30, uh, that's okay and the fact that 99.9% .9 will never go to court uh, doesn't bother us in the slightest. Uh, let me say a word about the specialized uh, bar. Uh, when I was a public citizen, we set up a counterweight to that, or at least we tried to, uh, in which we, we had argued by the time we set this project up in the early 90s, we had argued 25 or 30 or 40 cases before the court, and we offer free legal services to lawyers who have important cases in the Supreme Court in which the, the lawyers do not have as much experience. Most of these cases, the lawyer wants to argue the case him or herself. After all, most lawyers never get to argue a case in the Supreme Court. And when you get a chance, most people want to do it. They want to come to Washington, buy a new suit, get a haircut, and take pictures in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, I think we've had a lot of impact in that project uh, and have helped a lot. Uh, but there surely is uh, something to be said for the specialized bar, particularly in terms of getting the cases granted, which is often the hardest part of, of the process uh, that, to begin with. Uh, can, I, can I make a point? Me, can I just finish one? One other thing which people are probably not aware of, uh, as you know, uh, Citizens United was about independent expenditures. The court expressly said we're not deciding about corporate contributions. There is now a case which was cert petition was filed just la last week from the Fourth Circuit called Daniel Check in which the issue of whether corporations can be forbidden from making contributions is going to be before the court. I think it will be up there in time for it to be heard uh, this term. Uh, and so that will be up there. In addition, just one last thing, I'm sorry to, to go on, but what do you do about a case like Fisher, the affirmative action case, or the DOMA cases, in which there are actually corporations coming in on the side of 
the uh, one side or the other. Are those corporation cases or not? Corp many corporations think that affirmative action is good. They think that DOMA is bad. Do you view those as corporate cases? I don't. I, I think they're outside of the fact that corporations are willing to speak is interesting, but not dispositive. Sorry for going on. Can I just make a comment? Yeah, go ahead, then we'll go to the audience. Okay, go so ahead. just about the American Express case. What's at issue, as, as you were saying, in the American Express versus Italian Colors case is the enforceability of the class arbitration waiver. Concepcion uh, went further than might have been expected. Um, Concepcion, in Scalia's opinion, he essentially said that, as this is how I read the case, and I've studied it a lot, and, and so I could be wrong, but I think I'm right, uh, that essentially if you have a valid arbitration provision, if the arbitration provision as a whole is valid, and there's a class arbitration waiver in it, that class arbitration waiver cannot be attacked. It must be enforced. I agree with your interpretation. Okay. Now, if that holds, then I agree with Alan that American Express, mm -hmm. uh, I don't see how they uh, do not reverse. On the other hand, I think the court could step, step back from that, what I would call, very extreme position in Concepcion. And because what was at issue in Concepcion was whether a blanket rule of court, like the Ninth Circuit rule, could be used to invalidate class arbitration waivers across the board. And we filed a brief in that case, and we argued that the FAA required there to be a case-by-case -case adjudication on the, on the issue of waiver. Now, the court could step back from the extreme position and say, well, just like an arbitration provision can be attacked, which it still can be under the Federal Arbitration Act, so the waiver itself can. So that would be the only way I could see the court uh, upholding the Second Circuit. I wish you had been upheld in, in your view. Because in fact, what the court there said was, California had looked at these and said that these kind of waivers are unconscionable in these circumstances. And uh, that's what the Ninth Circuit and the California court did. They didn't say they're always unconscionable. They said they're unconscionable in these circumstances. And the Supreme Court walked away from that. They said, they said oh no, it's anti-arbitration. It's therefore always preempted. Well, I think that's wrong, but that's what they said. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for evocative impertinent audience questions if y'all want to mosey to the microphone. Um, I would implore you to resist the temptation to you know, lecture or disguise your question as a monologue, but feel free anyone. While people are thinking about that, um, while he's making his way back, just a, a personal question. For the first time in decades, a decision from my court has been accepted at the U.S. Supreme Court. And um, Gun v. Minton, and the issue is this, do legal malpractice claims oh, yeah. against patent attorneys, patent malpractice, do those belong exclusively in federal court or can a state court adjudicate those? And I just wondered if anybody cared to venture a guess what the court might do. I was on the dissent, by the way. <laughs> what, what was I, I was going to actually hope that you weren't going to tell me so I could express my uh, honest opinion. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah well, he but, didn't, but he didn't I, say which way it came out. No, no, I know which way it came true. out. It came out that said that, the, that, that only the federal courts have jurisdiction. It seems to be lunacy uh, that I agree with Justice Will uh, that, that uh, that's not what the patent clause is all about. Uh, and just because somebody says the word patent in a case doesn't mean that it has to go to the federal courts and then exclusively to the, uh, to the federal circuit. Okay, sir, go ahead. Hello? Oh, hello. Uh, the uh, alien tort statute case, I don't think anybody's talked about that yet. <laughs> I was just curious what, I, what the panel had to think about that. Well, uh, two things about it. First, uh, there were two cases that came up last year. One case was, I think, an easy case, and the court decided it nine to nothing. That was the... Uh, the more recent statute that, that said you can sue individuals and the, the I think, it, I can't remember which circuit, I, th I think it may have been the Ninth Circuit said, individuals doesn't necessarily mean not corporations and the Supreme Court said, no, 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 it means, it means individuals. That was the easy question and uh, it was nine to nothing. That, the, the Second Circuit had taken the same view and said that corporations were not suable under the alien tort statute. Uh, obviously the court, because the statute there says any person the court was not prepared to say that that doesn't include corporations per se. The, 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 the claim now before the court is whether the case can be brought in this case against two corporations. But I would have to say uh, that it, it also extends to individuals as well. If, if the arguments being made are essentially arguments that 
our court should not entertain actions of this kind, which would extend to actions against individuals as well as corporations. The big difference is that as a practical matter, individuals cannot, can avoid coming to the United States and being served and, and sued here. Corporations, in this case BP and Shell, are doing business in the United States. They admit that they're subject to personal jurisdiction here. And so as a practical matter, although the legal interpretation would not be so limited, this, the result that the plaintiffs, the defendants are seeking is essentially a result in favor of corporations, although I would acknowledge that it extends to individuals as well. Does is, is that answer the, the question? Yeah, there's one, I think there's one scenario that extends extraterritoriality. Yeah. Yes, but the, the extraterritoriality applies to both, in, in, in terms applies to both individuals and corporations, but it only matters if the person can be sued here in the United States. Essentially, all the individuals, whether they work for Shell, BP, or the Nigerian government cannot, as a practical matter, be sued here in the United States. And so whatever theoretical claims you have against them as individuals are essentially worthless. And of course, they have no assets here in the United States, so you can't collect it here, even if you, even if you could sue them. I mean, there's a, there's a case uh, that's pending. I, I don't think the court has ruled on a cert petition. It's, it's kind of a, it'll go away depending on how Kiobel's decided, but it's the Daimler Chrysler case out of the Ninth Circuit where I believe it's Argentinian citizens are suing over uh, horrible human rights abuses in the 1970s that they claim Mercedes-Benz of Argentina played a role in. They tried to sue in Argentina, but the statute of limitations had run. They tried to sue Mercedes-Benz, tried to sue Mercedes-Benz through Daimler in Germany where they have jurisdiction over Daimler Chrysler. Couldn't do it, I don't know why. So they came to the California and they basically sued Daimler Chrysler uh, for actions taken by a subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary, in a foreign country uh, decades ago uh, that involved foreign citizens. And the reason they brought Daimler Chrysler in, they said they had jurisdiction, was because Daimler Chrysler has a Mercedes subsidiary in California. Uh, it's a very troubling case from our point of view. The Ninth Circuit expansively read jurisdiction to say that so long as Daimler Chrysler has this subsidiary in California, they have jurisdiction, which seems to me to violate international shoe. But that's one aspect of the case. I do think if these are, this, this will be a huge case uh, if the court decides that the statute, which as you know is a very short worded, very vague statute, was never intended to do what it's been doing for the last several decades, which is this extraterritorial issue. That will be a huge case for, uh, inter for multinational corporations, that's for sure. Yes, sir. Hi, Michael Houston. Uh, it seems to me that sort of the m mainstream media coverage of the, of the court has both an incentive and a tendency to oversimplify things, right? So we have conservative and liberal justices. We have pro-business and anti-business cases. Uh, the administration won the Affordable Care Act case. Uh, they didn't lose it. The challengers lost. So I just wonder in your experience as litigants before the court and people who participate, do you find that those oversimplifications frustrating? It, th there's, an, there's an incentive, isn't there? Because it makes for better, it sells more newspapers if we have these ideological battles between liberals and conservatives and between business and non-business. Is that frustrating? Do you, it, does it contribute to maybe a lack of public understanding about the court and its work? Well, in terms of selling newspapers, nobody's selling very many newspapers these days. <laughs> so I'm not sure that, but I, I, got your, I got the drift of your question. Um, it is a little frustrating, and, and uh, when people uh, put labels on them, because sometimes, uh, I mean, for example, Citizens United, do you say that somebody who, who worked with the with majority are Justices Scalia and Kennedy and so forth, liberals because they supported the First Amendment, or conservatives because they supported corporations? I agree with you, extremely unhelpful. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I published on SCOTUS blog a little study about the Solicitor General and his one lost record and how you go about calculating it. And it seems it's, it's a much more difficult thing than you, than you figure, uh, in part because most of the positions taken by the Solicitor General in the last three or four years are positions which the federal government has been taking for decades. And it happens to get to the court now. Do you ascribe it to winning or losing to the Solicitor General? Um, and, and the answer is it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult to say. But I, I, I agree with you, and, 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 uh, but I don't know how we're gonna get the newspapers and the public to understand the degree of nuance uh, that, that you so rightly uh, uh, plea for. 
uh, with regard to Supreme Court uh, decisions. It's just too difficult. Well, one, well, one way to do it is a lot, a lot of us and the people in this room are called to comment when the Supreme Court makes these decisions. I mean, look, Concepcion was a straight up 5-4, and it can be portrayed that way fairly and honestly. Walmart against Dukes is 9-zip on a lot of important things. And, and although it is fair to say that there was one issue in which it was 5-4, I think that we have a responsibility every time somebody says it was 5-4 to raise your hand and say, no, it wasn't. It, in one respect, it might have been, but in important respects, it was 9-zip. I mean, it was the same thing that Bush v. Gore, not to raise that one again, but was 7-2 you know, on important issues, not 5-4. I think we've got we've to push back against that when we have the opportunity to do so. I'd, 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 I'd say that, too, because, uh, you know, it, oftentimes you get uh, – it's the state of reportage these days, or alleged reportage, as I look at a reporter sitting there. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, and this, you can really tell, there, there is a Supreme Court, a set of Supreme Court reporters who are superb. They understand the court, they write with nuance about the court. Who would you describe in that group? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I would include Tony Mayo, Joan Biskupich, uh, Nina Totenberg, uh, people. And if you get a call from a reporter like that about a case, you can expect to spend some time talking about it. The reporter is really looking to understand the case, understand its nuances, and do what really is a very, very difficult job of translating these difficult and subtle concepts into something that's both accurate and comprehensible by a popular audience. But oftentimes, you're sitting there at your desk on a Monday, and you get a call from somebody who says, I'm on deadline, I need a sentence. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so, you, sometimes you just say no. So, so the reporter says to you, I said to the reporter, but I haven't read the opinion. They say, that's okay, I'll tell you about it. I said, uh-uh, no. <laughs> no I, 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 but it's actually rather interesting. Uh, you know, the court complains about how reporters get it all wrong. There's actually a relatively simple way that that could be lessened. They could take all the reporters and say, when the opinions are coming down at 10 o'clock, you can have them at 8 a.m., but you have to stay in a room, locked at the court, you can mm. read the opinion and make your notes, and then at 10 o'clock, when the opinions are announced, you can then go out and, and, and start writing your story. You can write your story, but you can't transmit it. Uh, Is there any a particular opinion you're thinking of that might have, might have helped in that regard? <laughs> <laughs> you mean the 179-page opinion from last year, which people had to comment on instantly? Yeah. Well, it's, it's true of a lot of other things as, as well. Uh, uh, and and uh, But that's not something which appears to be on the court's agenda. And maybe I'm got some personal sensitivity to the reporting thing. I serve on a state Supreme Court that itself is often sort of portrayed, described as, as reflexively pro-business. And But it seems that people, as the questioner mentioned, often kind of simplistically look at who won and who lost, and then they begin um, you know, slapping labels and issuing press releases and ginning up fundraising, and off we go. And it seems to me that you know charges of a of a corporatist court often involves some some evidence skewing, in my view. And um, you know, Ed Whalen, I think a year or two ago, described it this way: that you know they often sort of drastically inflate the supposed importance of cases that fit, or that are distorted to fit, into the sort of desired narrative, while simply ignoring those that don't. And um, I just think, as Mark mentioned earlier. It's um, far more likely than not that judges' votes are rooted in really honest and conscientious disagreements about legal principle and doctrine. Well, by, by the way, I mean, it, it wouldn't shock me, and I'd be interested if, if my co-panelists agree or disagree, it wouldn't shock me if when you look at the uh, class action cases the court has this term, if Amgen is not 5-4 and it's more, more than 5 and, it's, and Amgen loses. It would not shock me if the Comcast case dealing with the standard that needs to be applied to expert testimony at the certification stage is not just five justices, the majority, and the business wins. And it certainly wouldn't surprise me if in the Class Action Fairness Act case coming from the Eighth Circuit, uh, it's nine zip and the business wins. 
Um, and if, if there is that kind of agreement, which case is that? that's the one uh, about the, uh, whether, whether as a plaintiff you can stipulate against, uh, you stipulate that you're not going to seek more than five million in damages and thereby, uh, it's the, it, I, I, the name of the case is uh, escaping uh, me, but, but so. They, gra they granted that They case? granted that They case. granted that. Yeah, and, 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 and thank heavens because that, oh, I, we've been dealing with cases in, the, in, in state courts in the Eighth Circuit that have been a nightmare since the, since the court. standard fire insurance. Thank you. Standard fire insurance gets no less. Any yeah. closing two cents worth from anybody else on the panel? All right, we'll give you about five minutes back. Thanks so much uh, for a spirited, respectful, but feisty discussion. Thank you.